Good morning and welcome to Oasis of Life Ministries. We're glad you're joining us. I do have a short announcement to make that Facebook has made some changes and therefore we need followers uh, in order to continue live on Facebook. So if you know somebody that doesn't have a church, you know somebody that needs this the message that we bring every week, let them know to look in on Facebook. And if not, we are also on YouTube. You can go to YouTube anytime. Go to our site, Oasis of Life Ministries, and bring up YouTube, and there's all kinds of messages there. So we're ready to get into this morning's message. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we just ask you and praise you this morning that right now a message comes forth in spirit and in truth. And that it comes forth with simplicity, that it's a, we're able to understand this message. And the anointing is on this message. And the anointing is on our hearts to open ourselves up to this message, that we receive everything that's in it. Everything you want to say to us this morning. And Father, we thank you for it. We praise you this morning. In Jesus' name. Amen. Hebrews chapter 5, if you would. And um, for the last few weeks, the Spirit of God has been laying on my heart over and over spiritual growth, spiritual growth. And that the body of Christ needs spiritual growth. So we're going to be talking about that over the next few, well, probably months. To grow us to the place we need to be. Because, just to put it bluntly, we ought to be seeing much more of the power of God in our churches, in our ministries. We ought to be see, seeing people being healed of what any disease. We, we ought to be seeing the body of Christ rise up and be prosperous, knowledgeable walking in wisdom, and walking in the power. Uh, when I think about Jesus just walking down the street and people who stopped him, I mean, the, the, one of the most amazing things to me was those blind men. They were walking on the other side of the street, and yet Jesus just passed them. They couldn't see him, but they stopped him because they knew there was a power there. And they got their, their eyesight. Peter. You know, you say, well, that's Jesus. Okay, how about Peter? Town heard that Peter was coming. Oh, we got so many big, sick people in the city, he can't possibly take time to lay hands on them and do all that. We'll just line them up in the street and let Peter walk down the street and let the anointing that flows from him, even in his shadow, touch them and they'll be healed. We need to get back to that. Yes. We need to see that. We need to have it happen today. Yep. So, poke your neighbor and tell them you're about to grow up. <laughs> you're about to grow up. I'm about to grow up. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Now poke yourself and say, I'm about to grow up. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 8. Though Jesus were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. Now that's the King James. And a lot of times we hear this, well, he learned obedience by what he suffered. I mean, he had to, you know, he had to go to the cross and he had to go to that whipping post and he had to go to hell. This is not what it's talking about. He's talking about his general, regular life here on this earth. And when we read these words, sometimes we've got to dig into them. And this word suffered here in this particular verse means by the things he experienced. Now, we have to stop and ask ourselves, what did Jesus experience when he walked this earth? Before he went into all of the punishment that he took for us and all of the cross and going to hell, what 
did he experience? Well, he experienced prayer or fellowship with his heavenly father. He experienced that a lot. Amen? What else did he experience? Well, he experienced his passion for his father and for the things that his father had for him. In other words, he had a passion for preaching and teaching people about God. He had a passion about seeing people get healed from their sicknesses and diseases. These are things he experienced. Well, he also experienced the anointing of the Holy Spirit within him. He experienced that. Remember when he went to the river with John, John was baptizing people, and Jesus came up, and John looked at him and said, wait a minute, I am not fit to even tie your shoes. And Jesus says, you are about to do what you need to do right here. You do your job. I'm paraphrasing, but you do your job, John, and don't be concerned about who or what you are doing this with. So John did baptize Jesus. When Jesus came up out of that water, the Holy Spirit came in him. He was filled with the Holy Spirit and walked in the fullness of God's anointing. Why? Because he obeyed God by the things he experienced. He obeyed God by praying and talking and fellowshipping with him. He obeyed God by preaching God's word, which means he had to study with God and know what God wanted for that time and that place. He, he had to walk from this place to that place and be where God was assigning him. He, he had to do all these things and he did it all under the anointing of the Holy Spirit and he had to obey when God said, you know, here I want you to preach this message. He would preach for hours, folks. for hours and amen. Many hours. I had one fellow a while back tell me, I can't come to your church anymore. I said, what's wrong? He says, your services are too long. His services would start with sun up and then would end when the sun went down. Brother Paul Copeland talking about being down in South America and he was preaching and he didn't realize that he had preached for about three hours and he announced to the people in quite a crowd we're going to take a break now and come back this evening and the people got up and started screaming at him no give us more give us more give us more Preached right on through the afternoon and evening. I did. I did. And miracles occurred. Things began to happen. Same damage. Glory to God. I told you about Brother Hagin. He would not take an assignment in a church unless he could be there three weeks. Every day. Two services a day for three weeks. He would take Saturdays off. But the rest, so you're, you're talking about 18 services. And he said how often miracles and things didn't occur until that third week. Well, it would. See, we need to hear the word, but we also need to be obedient to what God is moving us in. And, and right now, God is moving us in this area. How many of you know God is creator? Yes, yes. Amen? Yes. Folks, we can't forget that. We can't let that go aside. I, I realize that we've got people here in this auditorium, here in this, in this sanctuary. We've 
got people out there right now listening. I, I need God to get involved in my finances, or I need help, or whatever it is. My relationships are troubled. But folks, we've got to understand something and never lose sight of the fact God is creator. Showing us his power and realizing it. So when we look at this, we see Jesus was obedient to the things he experienced and being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto them that obey him. Now, perfect, mature, growing spiritually through what he experienced all the time. Jesus was as much a teacher as he was a learner. Yeah. Yeah. He learned from his father. Made a comment in the book of John. Jesus said, I don't do anything unless I hear it from the father. I don't do anything unless I see the father do it. The father would give him vision for what he had to do. And when and how he was to do it. He was made perfect. Now, a lot of times people read this and then we hear the preacher, well, see, he was made perfect through his suffering. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then we get into this what is called the suffering doctrine. We've got to understand this. Jesus chose to go and put his hands, put himself under arrest and never had he done anything wrong. And to take the punishment for us, he allowed himself to be put on that cross. Bible says he could call 10,000 angels down to destroy the whole world. But why didn't he? Because he knew. Because he knew at some time there'd be a group of people sitting in the sanctuary in the church in John's general Prophet hearing about Jesus and out there as well where we were from. And so he said, I will do it. And he did it for you and I. So we could be walking in this today, knowing that we have a place with him, and knowing when we leave this earth, we'll go to heaven. Hey, God. That's pretty good. But see, the Bible tells us in Matthew chapter 6 that God's will should be done on earth just like it is in heaven. I read the book there, Rob. There's no crying, no pain, no sickness, no disease, no lack, none of that stuff in heaven. And yet God is saying his will should be done right here on earth as it's done in heaven. Oh, we're going to get into the wrong place. Is that okay? Well, we're not made perfect through the devil's attack. We are made perfect through what we experience with God. Hallelujah. Amen. Let me repeat that one more time. We are not made perfect through the devil's attacks. We are made perfect through our experience with God, with the Holy Spirit, with God's Word, when we put it to effect in our life. This is what perfects us. Yes. This is what matures us and brings spiritual growth. That's right. Oh, yeah. oh. Verse 10. Call of God. <clears throat> Talking about Jesus here. Call of God, a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. Now, what about this order of Melchizedek? That verse of scripture. We could do 
new teaching for quite some time already. Abram, when he had to go up against the five kingdoms, and he called upon God, took his followers. Now get this, folks. You don't think, you think God doesn't want people prosperous. Abram didn't take all of his farmers. He took 300 of them. I would call that a pretty big farm. If you just make a portion of your helpers, your servants. And these were farmers. They're not warriors. They're not soldiers. They're farmers. But there's one thing Abram had on his side at that time. God. And he went up against those five kingdoms, defeated them, trained military forces, and his bunch of farmers comes in and defeats them. And gathered up all the spoil, all their goods. And what did Abram do? First thing he did was go to the high priest, Melchizedek, and give to Melchizedek tithes of all. What did Melchizedek do? He served Abram bread and wine, symbolic of the broken body of Jesus and the blood he shed, or would shed, for us. He served in what we call communion. Receive those kinds. Folks, in this life, we've got Jesus, who is in the order of Melchizedek. Every time we take, partake of what we call communion, we are honoring Jesus and the broken body that he had for us and the blood he shed for us to get us into a position where we could stand in the face of the devil and there isn't anything the devil can do about it. Right. We are more than conquerors through him who loves us. Who loves us? God, the Father. Jesus, the hope and the, the Son and the Holy Spirit. We've got a love interest. Amen. And they're with us. So hold your place there for a moment. We go over to uh, Hebrews, the third chapter. Same over there, the third chapter. Verse 1. Wherefore, holy brethren, Partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus. Profession is the same word as confession. Now, the church, and we're going to get into this along the way as we go. The church has looked at confession as only confessing our sins. Oh, we got to confess our sins to God. Oh, we're just sinners. We just got to confess our sins. Right here, he is the high priest over your confession of the word. Amen. We're going to have to gain something here. And that is the understanding that when we confess God's word by faith, it is as strong as God speaking in himself. Now, one other thing that Jesus did so. He had to face temptation. Just like we do. He faced the temptation of the devil. Let me take you someplace for a moment here. Keep your place there in Hebrews. We're coming back to that. Go over to the book of Luke. And the fourth chapter. Let's 
Start with verse 1 here. Luke 4, 1. And Jesus, being full of the Holy Ghost, returned from Jordan, Jordan River where he was baptized, and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, being forty days tempted of the devil. And in those days, those forty days, Jesus did eat nothing. And when those 40 days were ended, Jesus hungered. Now, I've heard this from many, many people down through the years. Well, God's just got me in the wilderness. I'm in the wilderness right now. Like it was some kind of bad job. But according to what I just read here, if there is a wilderness journey for any of us, it shouldn't last more than 40 days. Hello. Why? Jesus, all right. He's our example. But what did he do in this wilderness? He did two things in this wilderness. He did exactly what James wrote about. Submit to God and resist the devil, and he, the devil, shall flee. Amen. Well, this is Jesus, right? And he had to submit to God and resist the devil. Take a look at this. Jesus, get the, get the picture here. This is right at the end. I'm sure the devil did some other things trying to get him to do things as he went along in that 40 days. But right here, this is at the end. Jesus is at his weakest point physically. He's starving. He's hungry. His body is screaming at him. At him feed me. Feed me. And here comes the devil with his biggest attack. And the devil said unto him, If ye be the Son of God, command the stone that it be made bread. Now here's the point, folks. The devil knew Jesus could command the stone and make it bread. <laughs> Come on. Amen. <laughs> so the devil knew that. Jesus knew he could do it. But watch his response. And Jesus answered the devil, saying, It is written that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. What is that statement? It is Jesus' confession of faith. Yes. I don't have to do that. I don't have to make that stone into bread like you're saying. I can trust on God because he's the one going to feed me. He's the one who's going to take care of me. He's my provider. Yes, amen. Amen. Well, the devil will come back. He didn't do that. Let me try something else. And the devil, taking him up into a high mountain, showed unto Jesus all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said unto him, All this power will I give you. And the glory of that, these nations and everything in the earth. For that is delivered unto me, to whomsoever I will give it to him. Now, how did the devil get all this? Well, that, <coughs> that'd be true. We go back to Genesis, which we're going to do, probably not today. If you've got the outline, we're, we're not going to hit that outline more than just an <laughs> introduction to this. Adam bowed his knee and made Satan his God. And when he did, he relinquished the dominion God had given him to Satan. Let's look at a couple of scriptures. I don't know how many fingers you got left there, but keep your fingers in that. 
And in Luke, uh, well, let, let's look at this first. For, a for that is delivered unto me and to whomsoever I will give it. It was delivered to him by Adam, as we said. Look at John, Gospel of John.
Paul's asking a question here in Romans. Don't you know? You decide to sin. You are now a servant to that sin that becomes your master. But if you serve God out of obedience, that's a righteous act. Now you're walking in righteousness. Let me get one more scripture here out of Romans. Verse 23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let's not be like Adam. Oh, I committed a sin, but nothing happened. Oh, yes, it did. You may not even see the results for a while. But I will tell you this, you will see them. And one of those telemarketers on the phone here a while back, and, and, and of course he was doing his best to get my bank account information so he could steal money. And I asked him, I said, is your mother proud of you? I mean, does she know what you're doing? You're a thief. And he says, wait a minute, let me ask you, ask her, she's sitting right next to me. I said, well, sir, let me ask you another question. Do you know Jesus Christ? I don't believe in God. I said, well, let me tell you. God will help you. Jesus will help you. Oh, no, I don't believe in that. I said, okay, then let me tell you something. I am going to give you an okay to call me one more time. Oh? Yeah. When you die and you go to hell and you realize God is real, give me a call. <laughs> he hung up. It doesn't matter whether you believe God or not right now. You will one day believe in God and preach Jesus and preach God. Amen. The Bible tells us in the last days that sin will rise. They will call evil good and good evil. What are we seeing today? We're seeing it. It's our time, folks. But in our time, we're going to have to line up, mature in this, and start being obedient to God and His Word. Not just on Sunday morning, daily. Daily. Sunday morning is just our time to get together and be together in a corporate setting to praise and worship God and hear what God has to say. But every day, every day, we need to know what God has intended for us. Let's go back to uh, we were in Mark or uh, Luke chapter four. Let's go back to Luke chapter four here. So, Jesus is offered by the devil the opportunity to get all the power and all the glory and all the authority, all the wealth without going to the cross. But had he done that, he would now be serving Satan. And quite frankly, so would we for the rest of our time. Now, look at this. If you therefore will worship me, all of this is going to be yours. Watch Jesus answer. He said unto the devil, Get behind me, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. In other words, Satan, you got this through a sinful act. I'm not good at that. I will do what God has prescribed for my life right now, all the way through. This is another confession of faith by Jesus Christ to God. God, I'm not going to do this. I'm going to do it your way. Yeah, I see a lot of things in my life that I don't want to face, but I'm going to do it your way. And the devil 
Nebuchadnezzar brought him to Jerusalem and set him on a pinnacle of the temple, in other words, where he set him on the roof of the temple, and said to Jesus, If you be the Son of Man, God, cast yourself down from hence. For it is written, Look at the devil, he's quoting scripture. God shall give his angels charge over you to keep you. And he put forth his hand and touched him, saying, Whoops, turn too far. There we go. Luke chapter 4. And in their hands, this is the devil still talking to Jesus, and in their hands they shall bear you up, lest at any time you dash your foot against the stone. He is challenging Jesus to go ahead and prove God is your protector. Yeah. And I'll prove it if you do this thing. Watch Jesus respond. And Jesus answered and said unto them, It is said. Notice he changed what he was doing here. It's not just written anymore. It's been said. God said this. God said it. You shall not tempt the Lord your God. See, God was Jesus' Lord. That's another thing we need to get a hold of. When he was walking this earth, Jesus wasn't Lord yet. He was, he had a Lord. God. He became his father. Totally different man. And you shall not tempt him. Here's the result. And when the devil ended all the temptation, he departed from Jesus for a season. When he quoted the word, confessed it by faith, when he quoted what God said, Satan had to flee. Why? Jesus was submitted to God and God is in God's work. Amen. All right. So we find that Adam's sin gave all this to the devil, but now let's go back to Hebrews because we see Jesus now as our high priest. Look at verse 11. Of whom we have many things to say. And hard to be uttered, the of whom is Jesus as our, our high priest, of whom we have many things to say and hard to be uttered, seeing you are dull of hearing. When I read that, Start to think of something. How many people in the church today need hearing aids? I'm not talking about physical hearing aids. I'm talking about spiritual hearing aids. That's right. You know, sometimes when people, their, their hearing, their natural hearing goes soft on them. They don't hear so well. We give them hearing aids to help them hear better. We do have a hearing aid, folks. Yes. We do have a spiritual hearing aid that will help us to hear better when God's talking to us. That hearing aid is the Holy Spirit. And he's living in you already. Just turn his volume up more. Yes. Turn his volume. The song we just sang, I'm going to shout a little bit louder when these things come upon me. I'm going to sing a hallelujah and shout louder because my song, my melody is my weapon. Yeah. Bible tells us to cast down our thoughts and imaginations and start to come against the most high word of God. How do we do that? One of the best 
face to do that is to get yourself in a position like Paul and Silas when they were in the prison. They're in a dungeon. They're facing execution in the morning. They've been beaten. They've been stuck down there. They've been put in chains. They're in the worst place they could possibly be in. The sewer of the whole city ran through that dungeon. Rats and all kinds of just vile stuff. The smell itself had to be horrible. And Silas turns to Paul, what are they doing in this place? What are we going to do now? And what Paul said, I don't want you. I will praise the Lord. Oh, I would think their song to start was a little like this. I will praise the Lord. Almost all the life has been beaten out. But I'm going to praise the Lord. I'm going to praise my Lord. I'm going to praise the Lord. The two of them started, they built all of a sudden. It wasn't the fact, Paul wasn't saying, it's hard for me to utter this stuff. It's hard to be uttered because you're not going to hear it. You're not going to pay attention to it. A message like this that's being delivered this morning, it would be very hard for a lot of people in church to hear it. Somehow, the church has bought into this deal that we got to suffer to be made perfect. Jesus made us perfect through his blood. Amen. We're maturing through the word of God, and when we apply it to our lives, like Jesus did when the attack came. Amen. Well, he's Jesus. He's the Son of the living God. Let me say this real clear. Let me get real close. You're born again. So are you. Amen. Hallelujah. And God's not a respecter of persons. Let me see if I can wrap this up. For when, for the time you ought to be teachers, you have need that will teach you again, which be the first principles of of the oracles of God and are become such as have need of milk and 
not of strong meat. In other words, folks, we can't grow up, become spiritually sound just on the milk of the Word of God. The milk of the Word is sincere. It'll help us, but we've got to have the meat to grow. And he called those principles these things. Chapter 6, verse 1, Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, the doctrine of the anointed one with his anointing, let us go unto perfection, not laying again the foundations of repentance from dead works. Faith toward God is a principle. <laughs> yeah. Doctrine of baptisms. Laying on of hands. Resurrection from the dead and eternal judgment. Look at this verse. And this we will do if God permits. God's looking to permit the church to grow up and go further and be stronger and be what it should be. We ought to be Jesus Christ. Amen. I'll listen to you. Please do. Verse 14. But strong meat belongs to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use or by a habitual operation in have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. And I'm going to tell you when you say that's, that's the church. The church knows good from evil. I have a question at this point. When I hear people in the church say that God is tempting me or using the devil to tempt me and test me, that is not discerning good from evil. James said it this way. Don't you even say that God is tempting, testing, or trying you with evil. If God doesn't have evil, how can he test you with something that's evil? Amen. The Bible says God is light in that same, in, in the book of John, God is light, and there is no darkness in him. Now it's not going Close right here. Reason of use. Uh, I'll give you a couple more scriptures here. In Matthew 26, verse 41, Jesus is speaking. And he says, watch and pray that you enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. When it comes time to watch and pray, is your spirit going to take over? Or is your flesh going to take over? We go one more place.
was pray, get God to show you what's out in front of you so that you know the devil's going to attack. Now you know his attack. You're ready for it. To prepare our fight against him before he even gets here. Watch and pray. Habakkuk said it this way, I am going to step upon my tower. I'm going to sit here. This is my paraphrase. I'm going to sit here until God talks to me. And then when God talks to me, I'm going to look to see what I say and how I answer him. <laughs> That's a pretty good problem. So when God talks to you, how are you going to answer? Amen. When you're sitting there after the day and you're exhausted and you're tired and getting ready to go to sleep, and this has happened to me often, it just happened the other day, and the Holy Spirit begins to talk to you. Not now. Give me one at a better time. Love you. God bless you today. Now, some more.